Yeah, Strider, Arkansas, Benston. Albert Camus wrote my birth announcement to the world, and it's a little bit wordy, but let me read it to you. I didn't discover this until 54 years later, but on the day I was born, which is the day of the liberation of Paris, um, Albert Camus, who, you know, Nobel Prize for Literature and stuff, he was one of the founders of the Civil Rights Movement, but he died the day after the movement began. Um, but uh, reading his work, we uh, got a handle on uh, justice. He writes, on the day I was born, August 21st, 1944, nothing is given to men, and the little that they can conquer is paid for with unjust debts. But man's greatness lies elsewhere. It lies in his decision to be stronger than his condition. But if his condition is unjust, he has only one way of overcoming it, which is to be just himself. So, uh, Camus. It's kind of what I, what I looked like back then. So what, what position is that? Half back, corner back. Yeah, it was nice Michael Jordan had to borrow my number and LeBron James too. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's cool. That's funny, that's funny. Um, oh, that's, so, oh. Um, So have you ever have you seen, have you seen her since? Uh, a few times. She uh, she married the the uh, preacher of the biggest uh, right wing mega church in Arkansas <laughs> in uh, Van Buren next to Fort yeah, Smith. But, but she was a, there, but there? but she was a good person. I mean, you no know, ideology and cultural conditioning, but. Um, uh, we have a mutual friend that's seen her um, more recently, but um, anyway, those those things happen. People, uh, you know, mm -hmm. who knew what I was, well, they knew. <laughs> they knew what I would do. A typical, you know, high school life, and then just a few years later, you know, you're in jail. Uh, and and, um, um, and 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 it's so funny that that a lot of people just don't have you, you can't you can't look that far ahead right in in, in, in your yeah. life and and um, but was there anything in that period of time like from your high school experience that informed what you were doing um, um, just a few years later? Uh, there were. I mean, multiple things, but they were, you know, bullet points. Um, I think I told you uh, when I was five, um, my mother, uh, uh, she couldn't deal with housework she had made, which wasn't hard at that time, two and a half dollars a week for full time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she. Uh, one one time, the um, apparently the the mother or grandmother grandmother of the uh, the lady who was made came over one day with uh, with her grandson or um, or younger. He was littler than me. He was four, and um, they came in the front door, which uh, normally black people didn't do. But that was my mother wasn't bad, so it wasn't a problem. Um, and she was showing off her grandson and tells him to spell the books of the Bible. Well, I was five years old and I, I was a good speller and I read and all this stuff and I thought I was pretty sharp and 
here's this kid a year younger than me, and he's going up Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's like, I couldn't spell Deuteronomy, you know. So instantly that gave me a uh, perspective that could never be shaken, that there could not be a racial, um, you know, hierarchy of, of in intelligence, you know. So at five years old, I, I knew that for certain, just from one experience. But know. I assume your high school experience was segregated, right? I mean, you're in Arkansas, so it, it was segregated, completely segregated, and... and um, oh, they and, couldn't be anything more segregated. You see what they did in Little Rock. I was south of Little Rock, you know. Well, maybe you don't. That was the most notable thing in, in the world at that time. Uh, they had to call in the U.S. Army to protect the black kids that went to Central High. Several of them are friends of mine, little, the Little Rock Nine. Little Rock um, City Council and the school board decided they would obey the law. They would integrate Central High. So there were nine kids and um, uh, selected, and um, uh, when they came to go to school, there was a mob of thousands of uh, local white folks who assaulted them, and fathers called out the uh, National Guard to attack the kids, not the, not the mob. And so President Eisenhower had to send in the 101st Airborne to uh, uh, allow the school, Little Rock Central, to be integrated. So that was kind of the first local thing that gave me a picture of what was going on. John, John Meachin, great historian, wrote a recently, just a couple of weeks ago, published this book on uh, John Lewis, His Truth is Marching On. I'm in this picture, but I've never found where I'm, I'm about there. But there were 600 people coming, coming down, but uh, we didn't get very far past this point. The tear gas, the billy clubs, and the horses, they horse trampled us and, and stuff. It was major. I had just gotten out of jail because um, Malcolm X came to town. I think it was on February the 4th. And I, the first time I'd ever been in a courtroom in my life, uh, Friends asked me to come down and just check it out, and I was there, and uh, it's too long a story to go into, but um, four of us, two white and two black, got uh, convicted and thrown in jail for sitting on the white folks' side of the courtroom. And the FBI came and slapped me around, and they beat up me and my buddy one at a time while the FBI was uh, uh, interrogating the other one. They, they put us in the white cell and the K, KKK prisoners were in there and the sheriff gave them weapons to attack us with. But anyway, um, I had just gotten out on about February 11th and then uh, a couple of days later, C.T. Vivian was leading the, uh, the march down to the county courthouse and that was the day that he got slugged by Sheriff Clark. Well, two days after that, we were going to have a night demonstration in Marion, uh, 30 miles away, and just going to go out and walk around the courthouse and come back. There wasn't any uh, destination except back in the church. Well, the state troopers and Jim Clark's 400-man water posse, uh, private deputies like Ku Klux Klan, armed, and they all came up there to attack us, and we knew it was well, CT. Um, they wouldn't let me go up there because they said they would kill me because they, they knew what was happening. So I spent the night at an infirmary back in Selma, and we took care of the wounded when they came in all night. But CT preached that night, uh, CT Vivian, and um, um, that was the night they killed Jimmy Lee Jackson. So then we got together, what are we going to do now? And we were going to carry Jimmy's body to Montgomery and put it on the steps of the state capitol in front of Governor Wallace. And that was what 
was the inception of the March on Montgomery. And uh, so then uh, 10 days after that, um, uh, or a week after that, uh, was Bloody Sunday. So 600 of us are marching out of the church and uh, to Edmund Pettus Bridge. And um, I was pretty close to the front. Um, we were walking two or at most three abreast. And there were white folks uh, attacking people with their trucks and stuff. We had no police protection, of course. So I stopped back to direct traffic on Franklin Street, Franklin and Water Street. And um, uh, it worked pretty good for two or three minutes, but then a lady, white lady in a pickup truck uh, ran me down and hit me and bounced off. And I decided, well, let me get back in the march and go back up to where I was. So I hadn't gotten as far as I had started, but I was over the bridge and um, a lot of people ne never made it up to the bridge. But I was there and heard uh, Major Cloud say, you know, you know, there will be no demonstration. You have two minutes to disperse. And exactly one minute and five seconds later, he said, troopers advance. And that's when they came with the clobbering. Um, I got knocked out just for maybe 20 seconds. I mean, I got a glancing blow and I played football. I could duck pretty good. But I woke up and I was starting to get up and here's a trooper right in front of me and he shoots off a tear gas grenade point blank right into my face. And so that knocked me out again for maybe a minute. I woke up and all the gas and the smoke and here comes the horse charge. So I had to get up and make it back over the bridge. And it's a big bridge. The Alabama River is a pretty good sized river. And so I was bobbing and weaving all the way uh, back um, over the bridge and into the church, and um, uh, which is half a mile away. And that night in the, uh, in the church, uh, people were moaning and blood and tear gas and broken arms and stuff all over. And about, uh, about 10.30 that night, and this, I, I, get, I got the memory from the eight-year-old girl, Cheyenne Webb. I saw her again this year. She was there on the bridge and in the church and in their book, Selma, Lord Selma. Um, she describes there was this moaning and then it just, it turned into a humming and then, mm -hmm. ain't gonna let no tear gas. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round, ain't gonna let no tear gas. Turn me round, I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. So then everybody in the church started singing, and then people from the neighborhood for projects came in and filled up the church and we were singing and she says absolutely perfect she, they thought they had put us in a play in their place by a good weapon but at that moment we realized we had not lost we had won here they just called us foot soldier you know that was 50 50 years now it's 55 years but uh foot soldier you know <laughs> But whatever, I mean, most people played multiple roles. Organizer, demonstrator, uh, moralist, uh, uh, you know, uh, just philosopher. You know, that's the first time I learned about philosophy was, you know, all night discussions with movement people, usually a year or two older than me, sometimes elderly, farmers and and uh, but whatever we never um, they never allowed any serious discussion or history or anything in all of my years in school I mean it wasn't tolerated ah, okay there, there, there's a wealth here Strider 
Yeah, she so, was 86 when she died a month ago. And, and a southern girl. The first two snake workers were southern white girls. <laughs> She's also Southern, uh, Joan Browning. Uh, but I have, I have lots more like that, but that's... Uh let, me, let me talk about Connie Curry. Um, she died on, uh, I think, June 20th. Um, she was uh, uh, 87, I think, um, uh, born in 33. And she um, grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina, in, in the South, white lady, Irish. And um, she happened, she was working with National Students Association, went to Agnes Scott College, which was one of the few white colleges in the South that would sneakily have any contact with black people. There were very few that would allow any contact. So she started building her consciousness and relations and stuff, worked with the NSA for a number of years was back at home in Greensboro, and as history might have it, that very day was the day the movement started at Woolworths when four black students from AT&T sat in. And um, then she went back to Atlanta, and she already knew Miss Ella Baker, who was the uh, executive secretary of SCLC. Well, within two months, there were 70,000 black students and some white, probably four or five percent white students all over the South that were demonstrating against segregation. And so she called a conference in Raleigh, North Carolina, which I can't find my thing, but I have a program at that conscience uh, conference where uh, she and Jim Lawson and Ralph Abernathy and Martin Luther King all spoke at that conference. And that was the beginning of SNCC. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So when they got back to Atlanta, um, uh, Connie Curry was working as an adult advisor along with Ella Baker and they created some space for SNCC to begin happening. And the first staff member they had was also a white Southern girl her, named Jane Stenbridge. Her father was a Baptist minister. She was going to Union Seminary in New York and she came in and then uh, they, uh, uh, Bob Moses came down to work with SCLC and he had no work, they had no work for him so Miss Baker and um, Miss Ella, we called her. Um, they sent Bob down to Mississippi, and he got the, uh, the contacts that Ella Baker had created back in 1941 and 42, and that was the core of where the movement started. So anyway, Connie Curry uh, worked with SNCC for four years and then I uh, had been with the American Friends Service Committee and many others, May, uh, Mayor Maynard Jackson appointed her the head of uh, um, a uh, commission in Atlanta. She, uh, just incredible amount of work uh, she did. And um, another little connection, she went to Payne College in, um, South Carolina in uh, right in the beginning and they had a uh, they were attacked by a mob of whites as is almost everywhere this happened and she met Silas Norman who joined the movement at that point well his sister was the world uh, renowned uh, 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 opera singer Jesse Norman well his parents were providing uh, uh, funds for him to go to school for opera training, and he was there. 
Well, he dropped out, and, and his little sister got the, got the school stipend, which turned out pretty cool. Silas joined the movement at that point, and he saved my life along with other people when um, Jimmy Collier got me out of jail in Marengo County, Alabama on my 21st birthday, uh, going up to midnight that night. And when I got out of jail and came into the Freedom House at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I hadn't been there for uh, several months, so I didn't know who was there, and they didn't know me. They didn't recognize my voice or my name. And they were going to shoot me on the front porch. 2 o'clock in the morning, there had been night Riders coming through and shooting. But anyway, and they were shooting back. Um, they brought me back to the back, and Silas Norman turns on a lantern and says, Oh, put the guns down. We got a brother here. That was Silas Norman, and he was leaving town the next day. It was a miracle, and I've had a lot of miracles. So that's how I made it through that night. I became 21 that night and registered to vote in Selma, Alabama. Silas eventually went back north and became a brain surgeon, one of, a, a real one, not a fake one like Ben Carson. And um, so anyway, it was Connie Curry that brought him into the movement. I only met her uh, in uh, 04 and 05. Well, no, in 1995, or 2000, I went to a SNCC conference in Raleigh, and she, uh, I had driven there, and I didn't have any money for entrance fee, and she funded me the 75 bucks for, for so that was cool. But anyway, um, yeah, she had a whole lot to do with uh, people being involved in getting the movement going, and she wrote several books and she helped Bob Zellner write his book, The Wrong Side of Murder Creek. He was the only white Southern male more major in the movement than myself. And he was five years ahead of me, so. C.T. Vivian, he was my best friend among the top leadership in the movement. Um, he uh, died uh, last week at age uh, 95. Um, the only book I know written about him is Challenge and Change by Lydia Walker. And um, there needs to be a fuller development, but this is really well done. When he was a little kid in Missouri, Boonslick uh, country. Um, his grandmother, Annie Woods Tyndall, was basically ran the household, and um, CT was uh, six years old, and um, uh, there was a, a neighbor that burned down their house, and they lost everything. So. He was all mad and everything, and and uh, his grandmother says, uh, uh, "Don't worry about it. God will take care of him. You don't have to retaliate." And then he soon thereafter got thrown in jail and got killed in prison. One of his uh, one of his prison people killed him. So that was his first spiritual lesson. He uh, grew up in uh, Missouri and Illinois and challenged segregation then as a kid, but mostly just doing what he did and uh, dealing with the consequences and learning. Oh, one story of him, when he was, uh, uh, I think, 12 years old, um, he, had, was, um, he was the marble champion in the school. Everybody, almost everybody else was white, maybe 1% black. And um, he um, uh, had a uh, appendicitis, 
so he had to go to the hospital for appendicitis and he was when when they finished the operation he was supposed to go home and stay in bed for two weeks well his buddies came and got him out the window the next morning to take him in a in a wagon to the county marble championship and um he um uh, and, and he won. He won the championship for the school and for himself. Well, uh, 15 years later, when he uh, signed up for the Army, he had gotten a hernia from too much stress at that time, so he didn't get in the Army, and then his life ensued. He worked many different kinds of jobs, and on one job he had, after he had been... Um, He'd been uh, 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 working for many years in different fields, uh, labor, grocery store clerk, uh, greeting card service, uh, you know, whatever. Even in Denver, he was in Denver for a while working at, at a cafe, I think. He didn't start up in the church. He was uh, did various jobs and was director of... Uh, of a service center and stuff, and he wound up um, getting uh, inspiration to go into the church and went to Nashville in 1955 and became minister of a Methodist church there and then met with Kelly Miller and Jim Lawson and they began the Nashville movement in 1958 and Bernard Lafayette and John Lewis and Diane Nash and Jim Bevel and Marion Berry and Angeline Butler were students there at uh, Baptist Seminary or Fisk or AT&T. And um, they, uh, C.T. and Jim Lawson basically organized, trained and mobilized these students for a year then they marched in, and sat in at the lunch counters for a year, getting beat up a whole lot, John Lewis, Bernard Lafayette, the rest of them. And then they heard about the movement, the uh, sit-in in, in Greensboro, North Carolina. So they went there when Ella Baker called the, uh, the conference at Raleigh, uh, uh, in Raleigh at Shaw University, or college at that time. And so students all over the country, mostly in the South, got to get to knowing each other. And they went back to Nashville, uh, the ones I had mentioned to you. And a couple of days after they got back, the Ku Klux Klan tried to blow up the attorney's home and blew out 175 windows in the medical college across the street. I mean, it was major. And so CT heard about it at five o'clock in the morning, called many people and got them together. By nine o'clock in the morning, they were all meeting and making plans for what's called the silent march. And they'd been demonstrating for an entire year more than a year in Nashville to end segregation. So they planned the march and they did the silent march all the way through Nashville. 4,000 black students, might have been a couple of whites, I don't know. And CT was leading it with Diane Nash. Um, so the two of them go up and they confront the mayor. This They'd had a boycott for several months. It was Easter weekend right after. And uh, they'd been being beat up by uh, sitting in at the lunch counters and stuff. And CT makes an opening speech and then Diane Nash confronts the mayor. And she says, how do you feel as a man that some people have the right to eat and other people do not have that right? As a man, how do you feel? Not policy and stuff. And he had to think about it. And six days later, Nashville desegregated in April of 1960, first city in the whole South. So CT was one of the founders of that movement at that point, and later on went down to um, 
Birmingham and helped organize the Children's March. And, uh, and then um, he uh, went to, uh, uh, Martin Luther King made him director of affiliates of SCLC. And then when uh, we were in Selma, CT was my best friend among the top leadership in the movement. And um, I never got to really talk at length or really get to know many people because every few days I would be beat up and thrown in jail. Uh, I was targeted uh, many times. I got thrown in jail in court for desegregating the Selma courtroom the day Malcolm X came to town. So I did not get to meet Malcolm X, and then they murdered him a week later, 10 days later. And um, as soon as I got out of jail, uh, we had a march down to the courthouse, and the one where Jim Clark slug CT in the face and knocked him back on the steps. I was there. I was about 10 feet away when, when that occurred. Um, but I didn't really know him, but I was certainly highly aware and respectful of him. Well, a week later, no, four days later, um, we were having a protest march up in Marion. Um, that's where uh, the town where uh, Coretta Scott King and Gene Young uh, grew up in Marion. And the leader of the movement uh, was Cager Lee, an 83-year-old uh, farmer, and, um, and Albert uh, Haskins, who was a bricklayer. But anyway, I was going to go up there, but uh, they told me, get out the car, we need you at the, uh, at the infirmary when the wounded come in back to Selma. They knew they were going to get attacked. Well, C.T. Vivian gave the, the sermon that night, and then they went out, and then the, the whole state trooper force and, the, uh, and uh, Jim Clark's water posse was there. Um, uh, Sheriffs didn't have any boundaries in those days. He had a 400-man posse that he would he, he took them up to Tuscaloosa to attack the integration at the at the um, um, uh, at the university, and he brought them up to Birmingham to join Bill Connor and and beat up the the kids there and all over. Well, anyway, so they were all up there, and they turned off the street lights and then they smashed all the TV cameras and then they attacked inside the church and some people escaped out the back and Cager Lee got into Max Cafe with his daughter and his grandson Jimmy Lee Jackson and the troopers broke into the cafe and they shot Jimmy and, and uh, he died a week later and that was uh, we were going to carry his body to Montgomery and place it on the steps of the state capitol. That's why, when, and how the March on Montgomery was organized as a protest against state troopers shooting him to death, which had been a nonviolent demonstration. We only got attacked by hundreds of armed state troopers and posse men. So anyway, I... Um, I wound up being the leader of the internal security force for the march on Montgomery. Apparently there were two. There was uh, inner perimeter and there was outer perimeter. And I organized the outer perimeter. And the um, second night of the march in pouring rain, two o'clock in the morning, my guys caught this one tall white man and they bring him up, and I said, let's see some identification. He pulls out his uh, wallet. Uh, uh, General uh, United States Army, uh, General, uh, General Graham was, Henry Graham was his name. He was in charge of the Alabama National Guard, not the U.S. Army like they had claimed. He told us that he had sneaked through his own lines and my guys caught him and he praised us for being so assiduous. 
and brought us over to his compound, called in the whole regiment, said, you men do not seem to know who you are. And of course, they were all white and they wore Confederate flags on their uniforms, Alabama National Guard. He said, at this moment, you are soldiers in the United States Army. And if any man breaches these lines again, the soldiers responsible for it will never see the light of day. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Well, you see, in Eyes on the Prize, the last two days of the march, they're doing their job. They got their backs to us, and they're watching the, uh, the swamps where the snipers were. Tell you one thing about John, in the key point, the beginning of, of the of the mass movement becoming notice was the freedom rights. As a matter of fact, four years later, when I was in Selma, they still called us freedom riders. That was the word that the the white folks would use to attack us with, y'all freedom riders. So that's how significant the freedom rights were. And um, if you watch TV all last week or this week, you'll learn about John's role in that, which was really significant. Well, CT was in Nashville or Chattanooga at the time, and he heard uh, about blowing up the bus in Anniston, and, and so he immediately um, went down to Montgomery and finished up the Freedom Rides and got thrown in jail in Parchman penitentiary and um, so uh, they were together again John and Bernard and Bevel and CT and um, so anyway even at that moment in jail and in the Freedom Houses uh, there were very pointed discussions between nonviolence or violence or how do you react to this kind of uh, severe stuff. And um, John was um, uh, always on the nonviolent side and more aggressive people like Stokely Carmichael were uh, leaned the other way and this dynamic kept building over the years. Medgar Evers was the leader of the NAACP in, in uh, Mississippi and they mostly didn't do activist work, they mostly did legal, legal work, but Medgar Evers was absolutely the, as great a man as ever lived. And um, when President Kennedy first made his first speech for civil rights on television, they murdered Ned, Medgar Evers the same night in, uh, in Jackson. As soon as he got home, they shot him in the uh, in his carport, and they tried to kill Bernard Lafayette that same night in Selma. The FBI was connected, and they knew about it. And uh, and and another man in Louisiana they tried to kill that night, but he wasn't home. So anyway, uh, John gets a call to go to Atlanta, and. Then he gets appointed national chairman of SNCC, like a couple of days after they killed Medgar Evers, and he was he was just just turned 25 years old, and um, then they get the word that they're organizing the march on Washington. Bayard Rustin, who was the main person who who built uh, created the movement, he saved my life one time too uh, when. Uh, when they were trying to kill me in prison. Stokely Carmichael and Barry Rustin both were involved in getting me out. Um, but he um, uh, goes to, uh, uh, so he's the national chairman, and they go to, um, uh, to Washington, and John is the youngest man to speak, and I've got uh, 
uh, part of his speech uh, uh, from his original draft. Um, listen, Mr. Kennedy, listen, Mr. Congressman, listen, fellow citizens. The black masses are on the march for jobs and freedom. We must say to the politicians, there won't be a cooling off period. All of us must get in the revolution, get in and stay in the streets of every city and every village and every hamlet of this nation until true freedom comes. We won't stop now. And I say to you, wake up America. We will not stop. Wake up America. We cannot stop and we will not be patient. That's part of his original draft. And they made him tone some of it down, but um, it's hard to find. They made a record of the speeches, but the first one got out with John's speech in it, and then they cut it, and then the main distribution, he's cut out of it and uh, from the record, so it's hard to find that. But anyway, um, then uh, uh, two weeks later, they blew up the church in Birmingham and killed the four little girls. So that was uh, uh, right at that time, they passed the, uh, uh, no, a year later, they passed the Freedom Summer in Mississippi and all the violence and killing people and the bombs there. Finally, the Civil Rights Act passed, banning discrimination, but it didn't include the right to vote. So then we started up the movement in uh, Selma. Bernard Lafayette, who was John's roommate at uh, at uh, Atlanta, I mean at uh, Nashville American Baptist Seminary, he was the one that began the movement in Selma. Two and a half years of hardcore organizing, getting beat down, getting more people, and then Martin Luther King came in, and all of a sudden it's a mass movement. Martin didn't create the mass movement. Bayard Rustin one time said, Martin couldn't organize his way out of a paper bag, but God could he preach. And so everyone had different roles to pray, play and different ways to do it. I barely met John because I got thrown in jail almost every day, no matter where I was. They, they targeted me. So I barely knew him until the march itself, and I've told you about what happened on that day. Right. John Lewis uh, grew up in Troy, Alabama, and his uh, parents had been sharecroppers, but they bought a farm um, maybe during his very young childhood. I'm not quite sure when, but anyway, severely segregated, right near the town where um, uh, to Kill a Mockingbird was, uh, you know, was written about one county over from there. And um, so he heard on the radio about the Montgomery bus boycott. So he went there to uh, learn something. And um, oh, he wrote a letter. And then he came, and Martin Luther King saw him, and he said, Are you the boy from Troy? He said, Yeah, that's me. So anyway, he had a connection at that time, and then he, uh, with his parents' help or whatever, he got away to get to um, American Baptist Seminary in Nashville. And he was Bernard Lafayette's roommate. Bernard is currently the national chairman and CEO of uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he's the one who began the movement in Selma, Alabama, back in 1963, and then bigger in 64. And um, um, I, I spoke with him a couple of months ago. And, uh, uh, and so Bernard and John were roommates and were involved in all of these struggles in Nashville that CT had sort of and Jim Lawson had sort of pulled the students and educated them. And then when the SNCC started in Atlanta in 1960, you had the Nashville kids and the Atlanta kids, and they basically created a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And um, uh, uh, 
uh, Chuck McDo was the first chairman, but then after the uh, the movement in um, Birmingham had taken place, uh, they uh, they had a conference and they elected John Lewis chairman. Well, maybe after the Freedom Rides, 1961, SNCC had only barely begun, didn't have any real organizing projects going yet. Um, and um, John Lewis volunteered to go join the Freedom Rides as a SNCC representative. It was organized by CORE. Jim Farmer was national head of CORE. And they had two buses from Washington and they were going to go to uh, New Orleans. And it went okay. There were, I think, ten, uh, maybe more than that, but at least ten white and black, and they got to Rock Hill, South Carolina, and John Lewis and a white man, I can't think of his name now, uh, got severely beaten in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And then they got back on the bus and went to Atlanta and then to Anniston, Alabama, where a mob of 1,500 whites, armed mob, attacked the bus. They caught one of the buses right out of town and they uh, they shot out the tires and they uh, they bombed the bus and burned it and beat the, the people when they were coming out of the bus. The other bus made it to Birmingham and another bomb, a, a not bomb, a, a mob attacked them in Birmingham. And so Diane Nash was the head of the movement in Nashville and she gets a call about the attacks and they uh, have an all-night meeting in Nashville and they decide we cannot allow violence to destroy the movement. We're going to go down and finish the Freedom Rides. So uh, they sent uh, a load on the train down to, uh, to Birmingham and then um, Bull Connor learned about it and captured them and instead of putting them in jail he drove them back up to the Tennessee line in the middle of the night and dumped them on the highway in the middle of the night. Well they got lucky they found a black farmer and reconnected and went back and then they continued the march uh, I mean the freedom ride and they filled in the places of the people who had left. Well John Lewis got on the bus again, go down to Birmingham, and he almost got killed. And uh, John Siegenthaler, who was Robert Kennedy's top man, got severely beaten that day. And John dedicated his uh, one of his books to John Siegenthaler. Well, it was another mob attacked them. All of the police disappeared for about 20 minutes to allow the attack to happen. And then there was uh, a meeting in the church, about a thousand or fifteen hundred black people in the church all night. Martin Luther King was speaking, and um, uh, the Black Tra Taxi Drivers Union came to um, uh, send word to Martin that we're going to liberate you, and we're armed, and we got all the black taxi drivers here, and Martin. Uh, gets the message, this is like 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, and there's a mob throwing bricks in the windows and maybe some fire bombs and stuff. And he says, I want to see how many men are absolutely committed to nonviolence, show of hands. And out of a thousand people in the church, about eight hands went up, come up here. So then Martin Luther King, with Two or three staff members, probably Ralph Abernathy was one of them, and about six or eight men from the congregation go marching through the mob. The mob parted just like the Red Sea. They go to the head of the taxi drivers. They said, you can't do it this way. It won't work. you got to go home. And then they came back, and they marched back through the mob into the church and went on and continued until the... Um, uh, mobilized um, federal marshals came about dawn, about four hours later, and then things 
mellowed out a bit and then they got back on the buses and CT joined them uh, in Montgomery and they took the bus through Selma into Jackson, Mississippi and then they didn't get beat in Mississippi, they got all thrown in jail and put out on the prison farm at Parchman State Penitentiary. But CT, uh, who was older and one of the leaders, he was on that and got uh, arrested in Jackson. So uh, the, the threads keep pulling back together. And um, John Lewis, soon after that, I don't know exactly when, was selected national chairman of SNCC. And some people were asked why. Well, he's young, he's only 23. And, uh, well, he's the bravest among us, you know. What happened as after Freedom Summer in Mississippi and being betrayed by the Democratic Party in Atlantic City, and that's where I joined the movement, and I met Stokely Carmichael and Fannie Lou Hamer. And I came to Mississippi uh, three months later to join up, but nobody was there. So I rode my thumb and eventually wound up in Selma, and that's where my new life began in Selma in January of 1965. And. Um, like I said, I never met Malcolm X because I got thrown in jail the day he came to town because I integrated the courthouse in Selma that morning. And um, anyway, uh, things got so severe and there was a major struggle about uh, black power, uh, nonviolence, uh, organizing around the country as opposed to just in the South, whether or not to deal with the Democratic Party because we had been betrayed so many times against the war in Vietnam. Everything was happening right at that time. So uh, there was a uh, SNCC conference outside of Nashville in 66, uh, and I had been out of town uh, for a month when my father died and then back working with SNCC and then I went up north for a month and then I came back and I was late there um, uh, and the Black Power uh, coup really was taking over and we had an election. I spoke at one of the meetings but um, didn't go over too well and that night we had like a 20 hour plenary session and we took a vote and we elected, re-elected John Lewis as national chairman. Uh, he had about, people were worn out and not many were there. We had maybe 120 votes and Stokely had about 70. And I think Charles Sherrod had 10 votes. I think I voted for Charles Sherrod, I can't remember. But anyway, the meeting didn't end. They kept the meeting going until about one o'clock in the morning, um, there was disputes over the election and about 15 guys came in from Atlanta that we didn't know, I didn't know, and they demanded a new election. So it's two o'clock in the morning, there was another election and they elected Stokely as chairman. And then uh, SNCC um, uh, took the Black Power emblem and uh, They'd been doing great work in Lowndes County, Alabama, created what was we called the Black Panther Party, the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. And there weren't any whites in leadership. There were a few whites uh, on the, the board or stuff, but and organizers, but some people wanted it to be only blacks, and there was a dispute over that that went on for about a year and a half. And finally, at a meeting in... Uh, in Atlanta, Fannie Lou Hamer, who was the heroine of the whole movement, she spoke at that meeting in Atlanta when they were going to expel the last few whites, Bob Zeldner and his wife and maybe one or two others. I'd already been pushed out. And she said, I didn't join no organization against racism to become no damn racist. And so she left. And sadly, she died in poverty. Uh, but uh, uh, 
everything got changed and then you had all kinds of dynamic speakers but not much real organizing going on. So there was always this tension between the Stokely wing and the John Lewis wing and many of us were right in the middle hearing both sides and trying to figure out how do we pull the pieces together and um, um, I voted for John at that second election at two in the morning but uh, uh, Stokely's group had already taken over so but Stokely saved my life when the government was trying to kill me in Mobile in 1965 so there's everything gets complex and that's why we need to understand history because if you don't know what happened you don't know what direction you're going then you don't you make a turn you don't know if you're going back to where you had been uh, unless you understand the foundations of what the movement is about and it's the struggle for justice and humanity Now some folks take a peek and say I've done right well for walking 40 years in this downright hell. Some say my voice sounded mighty strong for a set to ruler shaking on the golden throne. Some say I sang aloud a powerful song for a set to people's crying for an end to wrong. But I wish I could have did it just a little bit more. So we never have to worry about no damn war. And the little children playing in the evening breeze will never have to go begging on their knees while their sister and their brother just gotta say, I'm sorry, can't help you. Gotta earn my pay. Cause the master got to have another condo on the beach. So we keep the things we need just a bit out of reach. And we sweat and we strain and we slave all day. Ain't got no time to think about a better way. And I fret about the ones that's too afraid to cry or to see the sun is shining in the noonday sky. They keep a tapping out the numbers and a punching out the keys to keep the money grubbers grubbing out the poor folks' needs. They talk so loud and long about the land of the free till we can't believe our souls is bound in slavery. So we try to toe the line and to follow all the rules. We even take instruction in the business schools. And they whoop us and they trick us. But the biggest sin is when they condescend to wanting to be just like them. So if we study and we practice and we make the grade, then they'll give us a position, say we're highly paid. And as we rake in all the dollars from the games we gotta play, we gotta keep on justifying until the judgment day.